Go ahead, Mayor. Okay. Well, good morning uh, to people we can't see, but uh, I am delighted to be here this morning with uh, uh, the councillors who serve on the Toronto Transit Commission, and I'm particularly delighted to have them here because these are very important uh, steps forward that we're taking in a report that's going to be in front of the Commission when they meet uh, very shortly, but uh, they serve uh, on this Commission together with civilian members, and I think it's one of the boards that works very well uh, in the interests of people who use transit and the people of the City of Toronto, and uh, they're here with me this morning, uh, our Deputy Mayor Denzel Menon Wong, Councillor Jennifer McKelvey, Councillor Shelley Carroll, and Councillor Brad Bradford. And also, of course, here this morning uh, is uh, the CEO of the TTC, uh, Rick Leary. And uh, I think online, uh, as uh, Lavin will indicate when we get to the questions, uh, Bem Case and perhaps others. Uh, but I just want to say as well, and I've had occasion to say this last week on Friday when we unveiled the uh, first of the bus rapid transit uh, lanes as part of uh, that, uh, initiative that we're undertaking in different parts of the city starting in Scarborough that it's a team effort and uh, there's 15,000 people uh, who have kept the transit system going during the pandemic who keep the transit system going all the time uh, and who are people that are all valued colleagues and uh, somebody like Bem Case for example he will be embarrassed to have me say this but I can't see him so it doesn't matter that um, you know he's written up a really thorough report about some of our vehicle requirements and these are the kinds of things that have to have years of advanced planning and they then have to have the consideration of the members of the Commission uh, who have to look after public finances and who have to look after the transit needs and balance all those different kinds of things and I'm immensely grateful for the work they do as councillors and for the work that people like them do in preparing these reports and for the whole team all the people that have driven the buses and kept the subway uh, trains the streetcars going uh, during the pandemic uh, so th this is an important day though and it's a good day um, for the future of the city uh, you know, we are continuing to focus, of course, on the COVID-19 resurgence that is going on. It's a serious matter that's in front of us and trying to stop the spread of the virus in the city. But business goes on. The advanced planning of the city goes on. I was speaking to a potential investor in the city yesterday. I was asked to speak to this person uh, who is in New York City. And I was proud to hear them talk about Toronto and uh, the stability here and the, uh, the work that has been done on a number of fronts by a whole bunch of people, including the members of council and otherwise, because it, uh, if I tape recorded the conversation, you could have put it on as an ad. But this is the work that has gone on, notwithstanding that we're trying to fight a, a, a terrible illness that has affected so many people. And we've got to be ready for the day when COVID-19 is gone. Uh, ready for every part of the city, which is the economic engine of Canada. And the sake of our being ready is not just for our own sake. Yes, that's first and foremost in our minds, obviously, as councillors and as the mayor, but also ready so that we can be the powerhouse that we are both in Ontario and in Canada. Before the pandemic, uh, you know that uh, with my colleagues, we were all very anxious to proceed ahead with investments in the infrastructure of the city, including transit. And so Council took action last year uh, at my initiation to uh, augment uh, the City Building Fund to make sure that we were doing all we could as a municipal government uh, to make the investments possible from a financial standpoint in the transit that we need. So it was important for us as a city government and important uh, for us as residents of the city, uh, people who, who live here as distinct perhaps from some of the other governments where the people may be uh, you know, doing their business elsewhere, that we showed that we were prepared to invest um, with you as the residents of the city who pay these bills locally uh, in our transit future. And so I acted to bring this forward and the council acted in turn uh, to support this augmentation of the city building fund um, confident that we would have your support in so doing. Investing in transit state of good repair isn't really very sexy, uh, but it is necessary if we want a transit system that operates as, at its best and, and at its most reliable for the people that it serves. So working with the TTC, we have laid out uh, a plan to start making those investments with your valued tax dollars. But it's also extremely important that our investments are in very short order, uh, matched by the provincial and federal governments. And I should say, at this juncture, they have been very good partners during my time as mayor um, in building the transit system and in helping us to, uh, to deal with it. Um, there are some issues that have been decades uh, outstanding with respect to uh, previously received operating funding, which would help a lot. Uh, we, we don't get the same support that many other places in North America do in that regard, but they've been good partners with us because they understand the importance of investing in transit, uh, investing in Canadian-built vehicles, and investing in our post-COVID future. And they also understand that transit is an essential part of the economic well-being of the economic engine of the country. So the governments, uh, the other governments, have been good partners, and I'm optimistic that that will continue. And it must 
uh, continue because we took too much time out on the transit file in years gone by and because I'm determined to see us back as North America's fastest growing city uh, once this pandemic is behind us, uh, we've got to get on with some of these things that we're going to talk about today. That investor who wants to come to Toronto, he's coming here expecting a quality of life in the city and expecting connections to jobs and opportunity um, and people like him. We want many, many of those to be calling up now and right after this pandemic is over. We've got to be ready to receive them with the proper kind of transit. So the TTC fleet procurement strategy and the plan released today is a roadmap on making sure that we can have the new vehicles that we need when we need them so as to keep the largest transit system in Canada, one of the largest in North America, running, uh, running properly and uh, with the ability to make the kinds of continued upgrades and improvements that uh, are necessary for that system. We have to start that process now. I think everybody would understand that you don't just materialize streetcars or buses or trains at the drop of a hat. You have to do the planning necessary to make the purchase, you have to make the purchase, and then of course the longest part happens, which is the actual construction and delivery uh, of the vehicles. So the report uh, going to the TTC, if it's approved, and I also have my colleagues here so that we can uh, have a little powwow and just make sure that this is going to be positively received, as I hope it will be, given all the work that's been done at the Commission. I know that, that it will be. But it pro provides for 600 uh, buses, new buses. 300 of them uh, hybrids, uh, picking up passengers starting in 2022, so not that far away. You can see why we have to get on with this now. And 300 new e-buses, and that will be, of course, pending the results of the head-to-head pilot a test that we're doing. We've got three different kinds of electric buses, the largest fleet in North America active in the field uh, using uh, picking up and, and delivering passengers and that would roll out the e-buses in 2023. And this sounds far away but it actually isn't very far away at all. 300 more all-electric buses on the streets starting in 2023, 70 more wheel trans buses starting in 2022, so again, two years away. 13 more streetcars in our streets, uh, on our streets and on our tracks starting in 2023, with a commitment to buy 47 more if the other governments were able to help us with this and provide their financial support to complete what would be the most desirable entire purchase of 60 streetcars. And it will also start the work we need to do because there's a lot of advanced work that goes on even for the procurement uh, of 80 new subway trains for Line 2, the Bloor Danforth Line, and to support the additional train capacity on Line 1, the uh, Young University Line, once the automatic train control system is up and running. Because, of course, that system into which many of your dollars are being invested will increase the capacity of the Young University subway by 20% or thereabouts, but obviously in order to take advantage of that capacity increase you have to have trains to put people on. So we would also proceed at the same time because of these kinds of advantages and the modernization of the Bloor Danforth line with uh, automatic train control funding for line two uh, so as to help accommodate new trains and obviously to decrease some of the congestion that we uh, face there as well as the electric vehicle charging infrastructure necessary to uh, support the move towards a fossil free and emission free uh, fleet uh, which we're doing as rapidly as uh, will be possible. So we'll be pursuing quite aggressively this funding that we need from the other governments, but we thought it was very important for us to put our money on the table first, as it were. And thanks to the augmentation of the City Building Fund, the expansion of the City Building Fund, approved by City Council and paid by you, uh, we're able to say that we're putting our money down first to say we are going ahead with this, we have to go ahead with this, and we're going to show our own good faith and our own capacity to uh, have the people of the City of Toronto pay uh, their share. And now we have to turn to the other governments to ask them to participate as partners with us as they have done so often in the past. I have already begun telling them in conversations I've been having with them. I met with the Toronto MPs uh, a week or so ago. I talked to the ministers, including the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister frequently. Um, and I tell them that it's about better transit. It's about jobs here in Ontario and here in Canada, and that's very important. It's about Canadian technology. It's about greener, a uh, greener city uh, here in the city of Toronto. And it's about connecting people to opportunities through uh, improved public transit. The discussions have gone well. I don't want to suggest we're anywhere near a commitment uh, on their part, but I have said, uh, I will say to you, the discussions have gone well thus far, and I believe these governments will partner with us again as they have done in the past, because this is in the best interest of building up the economic engine of the country and making sure it's a city that is green and prosperous uh, for the benefit of all Canadians. The uh, our, our share is there now to start with this and we're going to move ahead if the report is approved uh, but we need their share obviously to do everything that it is we have planned to do in the interests of uh, the city. You know 2022 and 2023 sounds like a long way off but 
we're almost at 2021, so that's why this report's here now and why we have to move uh, forward with it. It's, the blink, it's a blink of an eye in the world of transit and manufacturing of sophisticated vehicles. And in the past, uh, we've often waited to get the commitments from the other governments before we move forward, but uh, the recommendation here from our staff, and I think it's a good one, uh, the, the Commission will consider it, uh, is, is to move forward now and do what we can do. And there's quite a lot we are doing with uh, what I'll call municipally city-raised money from you as uh, city taxpayers. We're going to be the first first movers this time to indicate how important this is and to get on with it and to get those first th 13 streetcars and the first allocations of buses and other things that we can do on our own. So it means we have about 40% of the funding on the table now, uh, but we obviously need to get the other 60% and get that as quickly as we can. In conclusion, I want to just thank Rick Leary and his team. I started off thanking them, but I just... Um, you know, when you're in a job like mine and, the, and my colleagues, um, I think you marvel every day at the fact that a great big complicated city like this, that the water turns on every morning and the sewage goes away when you, when you flush and, and that uh, the parks are kept clean and the roads are kept functioning as best one can, the transit system works even through a pandemic and that's because of the hard work of people like Rick and his team at the TTC and of course all of our uh, city staff. And I will now in turn get on with my job, uh, which is to uh, be the sort of principal advocate to the other governments to secure their investments in these much needed uh, transit initiatives. I know from the existing solid partnerships we have with those two governments, the go government of Premier Ford at Queen's Park and the government of Prime Minister Trudeau in Ottawa, that they understand that these investments are necessary, that you have to do the forward planning to, to commit to making them now, and that they are necessary to make sure that we can keep Toronto strong and green and fair and prosperous in a post-pandemic world. And we hope to get to the post-pandemic world as soon as possible, but we've got to be ready uh, for that day, and we've got to just be ready for the future, whatever it may bring. So um, I think at this stage, uh, I, I, we're, we're able to answer questions, and Lavin will indicate who else we have available to you online, as well as Rick, of course, being here, and myself, if there are other questions that don't relate to transit, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you for joining us today. We will now open the floor to questions. As a reminder, it's one question, one follow-up. On the line, we also have Bem Case, Head of Vehicle Programs at the TTC. First up, we have Mark McAllister from City News. Go ahead, Mark. Mayor Jari, uh, you had just mentioned you can take questions on other topics as well. I'm just wondering if I could start on a different topic and then of leave course. it to my colleagues to yeah. ask questions about this. Uh, the Auditor General's report, a number of Auditor General reports uh, have been released. I want to ask you questions about a couple of them. One is with regard to the uh, Home Ownership Assistance Program and your plans for affordable housing. Um, one of the reports suggests that there needs to be a need to better measure effectiveness. And there's a couple of examples of applicants uh, being approved for loans despite the fact that they have assets or addresses outside of Toronto. So my question, um, I guess, is how do you meet the certain goals when the program itself isn't being run effectively? Well, this is why you have an Auditor General. This is why you have an Audit Committee. Uh, you know, from my experience in, in running a, a large company, we had an internal audit uh, you know, group there that went around and found ways in which we were not meeting the test that people would expect. And so in a great big organization like this, you're going to find that there are places where we fall short. We now have the report. We have an indication of where we have fallen short, for example, in having that grant extended to people who don't even live uh, in the city of Toronto. And we now have to fix the process. And I can just tell you, I know that Councillor Holliday, Deputy Mayor Holliday, the Chair of the Audit Committee, and the members and the members of Council and me all take these things seriously, and we will have to report back. That's what happens. You get this report. It has its recommendations. Uh, it has its findings, and we now have to respond to it. And I can assure you we will, because we are not anxious to have people taking advantage of programs like this who shouldn't be, uh, who shouldn't be receiving the benefits. And as a follow-up to that, uh, it's not a, also, it's, it's a matter of effectiveness, but it's also a matter of saving money at a time obviously when there's a need for being able to do so based on the massive shortfalls that yourself and the city manager have talked about. Another example would be the, the winter maintenance program and the contracts uh, with contractors. They've found more than $7 million in overpayment over the last five years to these contractors because of a manual process that's being used as opposed to a digital one and errors in documentation. Is enough being done to find those efficiencies that you need at this point? Again, 
this is why we have an Auditor uh, General, this is why we have an Audit Committee, uh, and I was very interested to read about that and to see that, uh, again, we'll have to look at the numbers, And but if, if it's millions of dollars, if it's $1 million, if it's $100,000, you want to try and save it if you can, and the investment you might make, for example, as is pointed out in the report, an additional GPS being put on vehicles that allows you to be more efficient as to how you plow the snow, and some degree of quality uh, control, because it was also pointed out that uh, in some cases, sometimes for valid reasons, uh, streets don't get plowed the way they should. And, you know, people do get paid to plow them. So I think this is a uh, exactly why you have an audit committee and an audit process is to identify these kinds of things. And I can assure you, I am looking for every penny under every couch cushion that we have in this city hall. We have found $500 million plus in savings because we've had to during the pandemic and we will continue to do that. And this is another good example of a place where I'm sure we can find more. Okay, next up we have Matt Bingley from Go Global. Go ahead, Matt. Hi, good morning. Mayor Tory, uh, you, you were talking about the importance of maintaining transit infrastructure. This weekend there is going to be some of that on the go when you have uh, uh, an entire subway line closed down. Now there, there have been already issues with crowding on buses and it seems that the surface route will have to bear the brunt of that this weekend. For the, the people that are trying to get around the city this weekend who are essential workers and then there are those who are, are probably not, would you have a message of of perhaps staying home if you don't need to get to, to work? And, and what message would you have for people that are trying to get to work this weekend on those lines and, and are facing all that crowding? Well, the public health advice, of course, has been to people that uh, if you don't have to go to work or to school or to uh, physical fitness or other things that are important, uh, that you should stay home just in the interest of trying to contain the spread of the virus. But to those who have to go to work, I will just say to them that there's never a good time to, to close down all or part of a subway line in order to do much needed construction and maintenance. Um, so we try to pick the best time. We're trying to accelerate some of that work during the pandemic because ridership and traffic levels are down. Um, we will have a small section of the Young Street subway closed for 10 days uh, coming up later this year uh, to remove asbestos. And I think most people would endorse uh, you know, the removal of that asbestos because it's not a good thing to have in the subway system. But when do you do it? You can spread it out over, you know, doing it in the middle of the night for like weeks on end. Uh, it's just not efficient to do it that way. It's not effective. And so we're going to move ahead and do these things. I will say to you that I'm very empathetic to the fact that people are disrupted in their getting to work and in just their daily lives by these different closures we have in order to do the construction of the automatic train control and things like that. But I will tell you that is only exceeded, my empathy is only exceeded by my determination as mayor to get this work done. We've postponed this stuff in many cases for years and the city paid a terrible price for that. And so now we're getting caught up, we're making the investments, we found the money in partnership with the other governments and we have to do the work. And in order to do the work, people I think understand the common sense of saying you can't have people working in a subway tunnel, for example, when the trains are running. And so we have to do it at a time when the subway is not running or cause the subway not to run for brief periods of time and you pick the times when it's least busy, which is sometimes on the weekend. So I, I do feel badly about that in terms of the disruption it causes and we will have uh, shuttle buses as always available to make sure we can move people around. And just on a different topic, uh, the, the city manager was laying out his renewal report uh, or the city's rather renewal point and uh, and he indicated that he has some real concerns about the future of the retail sector in the city with so many people moving to the digital realm and and he was concerned about it, it potentially being able to come back from that I'm, I'm wondering if you share those concerns and and what you would say to a business owner that is is just trying to hold on right now with that uncertainty I would say first and foremost to them that we are there to help and programs like Digital Main Street and Shop Here, uh, these are programs initiated by your city government during the pandemic. And, and in fact, Digital Main Street well before the pandemic are designed to say, okay, it's going to be tougher to do business in retail from people walking into the store because there are so many people shopping online. But the good news is that if you can get online and have an effective presence there, no matter where you are in the city of Toronto, you can be selling your goods and services to people from across the world. And so we have to look at these things and say that the transformation that was taking place in retail was happening long before the pandemic. The pandemic has made it worse. And now our job as a city government, working with the other governments, is to help 
help tide people through, which some of the federal and provincial programs are doing, and then some of our programs help people to get on uh, the, these platforms that are going to help them to take advantage of the transformation that's going to be something that's going to only accelerate after the pandemic, as it would have anyway. So we are really on this. Uh, I, I am participating actively in many, many meetings and, and, and uh, exercises with the Board of Trade and others to help make sure that as many of these businesses survive, first and foremost, and then can find a new way to be prosperous, which I'm confident they can uh, in, in the world going forward. A lot of our retailers in Toronto, uh, especially some of the independent people, they have goods that nobody else has. They have unique products. They have unique ways of, of serving people. And the challenge they have now is to sort of reach people in a new way when people are more reluctant to go out and when they're more inclined to go online to find uh, those kinds of services. And that's exactly what the city government's doing. It's been a, a, a cornerstone of our efforts to help people through the pandemic. And we've helped literally thousands of companies to get a proper online presence and to be able to take advantage of that and, and shore themselves up. Next up, we have Stuart McGinn from 680 News. Go ahead, Stuart. Uh, Mayor Tory, just wanted to ask you about uh, another off-topic uh, here uh, about Halloween. We've seen other cities kind of come forward and say, you know, they're banning it or at least advising against it. Wondering where you guys are at with this. I know you said you were waiting to kind of have more talks with the province on it. Uh, is this something you're considering a ban? Where are you at with it? I will boycott, by the way, other questions until there's one on the transit. Uh, I'm just kidding, but uh, this is very important, uh, Dave. But having said that, let me deal with Halloween. We had a very preliminary report from the Medical Officer of Health this morning, and I'm not going to get into the content of it because it is far from representing the kind of consistent, consolidated advice I hope people are going to get. Uh, she did report that the provincial people that give them advice on these matters are also having a meeting very soon. Uh, and our objective is by sometime very early next week to be able to provide, I hope, consistent advice, meaning one stream of advice, especially for areas that are in what they're now calling the red zone, these higher risk areas for COVID-19, be able to provide one stream of advice. And it is my hope, because we discussed this at the meeting that I chaired of the GTHA mayors, that we can all across the region provide consistent advice so people don't get confused. Uh, so we're working on it. Uh, it is not an easy thing to deal with in the context of any kind of black or white answers, but we hope to have some advice for people very soon. Follow up, Stuart? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, thanks. Next up, we have Ben Spur from the Toronto Star. Go ahead, Ben. Um, this uh, report recommends buying more streetcars from Bombardier. Um, can't and, quite you know, hear the company uh, almost, yeah. almost ended up... Ben, uh, could you just hold on one sec? Here. Because we just can't quite hear you, and they're going to, I think, turn your volume up a little bit at this end here. Oh, sorry about that. No, there's no problem. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I think, have you turned it up now? They're just doing it. Yeah. Go ahead, Ben. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, now we can hear you better. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Okay. Um, this report recommends buying uh, more streetcars from Bombardier. And, you know, while the company almost ended up meeting its deadline on, on the previous order, um, just given all the trouble that, that the company had earlier in meeting its schedule, plus issues like having to recall dozens of the cars for welding defects, plus problems it's had delivering um, workable vehicles to other jurisdictions, do you have any hesitation about spending at least $140 million in taxpayer money on another purchase with that company? Well, I guess the hesitation that I had has been overcome by the hard work done by the TTC staff and working with Bombardier to answer the questions. And I will say that I was one who was quite outspoken in my criticism of Bombardier for the poor way in which they served us earlier on. There was a gradual trend to improvement in terms of how they uh, delivered and, and manufactured the product. We're actually quite happy with the product, and Mr. Leary and others can speak to this better than me. But I think here's the real bottom line going forward, which is, first of all, um, if we were to switch technology, as it were, and some of the other people that we did reach out to and ask them to express interest had, I think Bombardier was the only company that could actually deliver on the same technology that we have, which is very important. But that kind of thing would lead to a delay in our ability to get these streetcars and put them on the track. So, for example, we can free up buses to deal with some of these routes that are overcrowded. Um, I think it's an important matter to take into account, not entirely, but it's a factor that we are going to help preserve Canadian jobs. And they're not jobs that are in Toronto, but they're jobs that are in Ontario and they're in Canada. And any chance you can get to, to support Canadian companies, I think we should do that. We have an existing relationship uh, with them. So I think when you look at everything and the commitments they have made to do better, and the fact that there's reason to believe they can because they were doing better towards the end of the last uh, set of streetcars, um, the recommendation is to go with them. And uh, the Commission will duly consider that. And I'm sure debate that in full, but uh, that that's the recommendation, and I support it. 
And as a follow-up, um, ridership right now on the TTC, of course, is, is way down, uh, and exactly how travel patterns will, will change post-pandemic is still unclear with things like work from home and, and that kind of thing. So can you expand a bit on how we can be confident that all the vehicles in this report uh, are needed and are needed so urgently? I spoke, as I indicated earlier on, uh, yesterday with a man who wants to move his company uh, from the United States to Toronto, and he wants to move his family and himself and, 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 and hire a whole bunch of people here. I'm very optimistic about this city and its future. I keep saying to people, because I'm selling the city every single day, and I haven't stopped to try and attract investment to come here, and I say the smart people that were here, the diverse people, our way of life, our values, and the infrastructure of the city make this still one of the most attractive places in the whole world to invest and to come to live. And I'm very optimistic that when the pandemic is over, you're going to get, if anything, increased desire on the part of people to come and live in Toronto. And we've got to have the transit. We fell behind on things like transit and affordable housing and other things, and now we're trying to catch up. And so the notion that we should sort of sit back and see if people come and put ourselves in exactly the position we were in before, which is all these people arrive here, all this investment arrives here in this great city, and we have not purchased the vehicles and built the transit and built the affordable housing to accommodate them, that would be a grave mistake that I won't make. I'm optimistic about the city, and that's why we have to get on with purchasing these vehicles now. The ridership will come back, and new riders will come to the city, and we need to be able to provide for them when, when that happens, and I hope that's happening very soon. Next up, we have Lucas Myers from News Talk 1010. Go ahead, Lucas. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor, given that these are investments for the short term, as you mentioned, you know, it's really around the corner. How does the, you know, the long-term plans for the new subway lines you know, play into this in terms of, you know, future procurement? Or, or is that just, you're not even thinking about that right now? No, no, we are. That's, that's a really good question, actually, because if you look in, into the uh, depths of this report, you will see that one of the things we have to do, and you've got to think about it now, is that the Scarborough subway extension, the Bloor East subway extension out into Scarborough, which which seems like it's a long way away because it's going to be take quite a long time to build it, but that will necessitate itself the purchase of additional trains and again you can't buy those trains the day that the subway opens so we've got to make all the plans now not just on the basis of trains that need to be replaced not just on the basis of increased capacity of line one because of the automatic train control but also on the basis that the subways uh, are expanding or at least the one subway extension is going to be built with the conventional technology and we have to have trains to service that and so all of that is taken into account in all of this similarly the young street north extension which is also something that is going to be built up into York Region. Uh, that will necessitate some additional trains. So uh, all of this, you can see the report itself is quite long range in its look, but so is our budgeting. I mean, we have a budget now for, for 10 years to account for all of these different purchases, at least our share. What we're now looking to do and move forward with is to get the commitments of the other governments to do just that. And this looks after a lot of those different kinds of requirements that we're responsible for. And just to go back to what Ben was asking before about Bombardier, um, and, and, and I apologize if you might have touched on this and I missed it, but is there going to be any sort of, you know, um, you know, you know, difference in terms of the way the contract works if this does go ahead in terms of assurances or insurance or, or something like that that is, you know, marketably, uh, markedly different from past agreements to ensure that there, if there were to be any problems that they could be resolved uh, with less headache, I suppose? Well, you're talking about a contract that hasn't been negotiated yet um, and because it hasn't been approved that you should go ahead and purchase these streetcars from Bombardier, so we're a little bit ahead of ourselves, but maybe I'll ask if either Rick or is it your or Ben that should answer that yourself? I can answer that. Okay, that. there you go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a pleasure to be here today with everybody. You know, I'm very excited. It was less than uh, 20 months ago that the TTC actually put a long-term plan together with its capital investment plan to identify the need for the funding to address the issues that we have today. And in that short time frame, this 20 months, right, where the council make, takes the, uh, the stance, gives the TTC an additional four plus billion dollars to address the critical need of, of infrastructure and vehicles. So but to answer the, the, the question directly, as we are negotiating with Bombardier now, all right, and having a discussion about holding them accountable. We're very uh, pro-Bombardier when it comes to the fact that our operators and our customers really like the vehicle that's on the street today. The reliability of the, the vehicle has come a long way. We know there were challenges early on, but I'm very pleased with the, uh, the direction it's going in. But they will be held accountable right up to the end of the delivery, uh, should it be approved by the board. Okay, next up we have Nick from CBC. Go ahead, Nick. Nick, 
Can you hear us? Go ahead. Okay, we will come back to Nick. Uh, next up, we have Chris from Global. Chris, go ahead. Morning, Mr. Mayor. Um, the National Council of Canadian Muslims uh, says in the past six months, um, uh, almost all of the downtown Toronto mosques have had some sort of dangerous threat to, to them and their, their members. Beyond statements of support for them, uh, what are you and the city doing to support the mosques and that Muslim community in those mosques? I've spoken with the President of the National Council in the last few days since the most disturbing incident, the most recent disturbing incident that took place. Uh, and uh, I've spoken with the Chief of Police uh, because we're obviously wanting to make sure that we both investigate and proactively take steps to try to deal with that. Uh, we've just embarked on the latest chapter in our campaign about uh, anti, it's, it's, it's referred to as anti-racism, but it's really kind of anti-hate and anti-discrimination. So I think we're trying to raise awareness of that. And I will be uh, visiting a mosque in the very near uh, future, uh, in fact two in the next uh, few days, um, to show my concern. But in the end, um, a lot of it's going to be about uh, making sure the laws are strong enough to deal with this sort of thing, making sure the police have the resources to investigate these things when they happen, but most of all, um, continuing to educate the public about the fact that w we are all in this together, that our values that are admired by those people that I speak to in selling the city, they're recognized and admired, that we embrace everybody here, we get the best out of people regardless of their faith or their color of skin or their nationality or their sexual orientation, that's what makes Toronto special. And so we're just going to have to keep working at that. You notice that I speak quickly when these things happen to condemn this kind of thing. And fortunately, you know, we're far from perfect, but these kinds of incidents are, are few and far between. But uh, there's, there has been an uptick, uh, to say the least, in, in uh, attacks uh, of different kinds on uh, mosques and on people of the Islamic faith, and we're going to have to deal with that as best we can through all the different means that I uh, mentioned in a moment ago. Okay, no follow-up from you, Chris. So he's got why he's, no, he doesn't we're going to have Chris uh, ask a question on Nick's behalf just because okay. we can't get Nick's audio <clears throat> fixed. So go ahead, Chris. So this is, uh, this is from Nick. Uh, do you think the upcoming federal by-elections in Toronto should go ahead um, due to uh, COVID concerns um, that have been raised and including from the Green Party candidate? What are your thoughts on the by-elections coming? I will say that, uh, you know, they say timing is everything in a lot of aspects of life, and uh, it's unfortunate for her because she seems to be a, a, a person that, uh, you know, had off offered herself for public office and then became the leader of the party, uh, and it might have been advantageous for her to have more time to prepare, but the by-election had been called uh, by then, and I will, on the principal part of the question, I see no reason why we can't proceed uh, subject to appropriate physical distancing and a lot of different things that can be done to make sure that the election is held safely to proceed with all, co all manner of elections that are necessary to be held. We've seen in other provinces in Canada, they've conducted provincial elections safely. There was no suggestion from those places that there was a health risk. And as long as you're careful and put all the different measures in place, I think these things should proceed. Democracy has to go on. People need representation. Um, and we just have to be careful about how we do it. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Put my mask back on. First things first here. Oh yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Oh, amazing. So for sure we have room for it. Thanks for, uh, like, sorry it was so hectic, but thank you for that. Yeah.